Tonight, History of the Heartland is a great pleasure of meeting with Tim Kane. Tim, you've been with the Herald and Review in Decatur for now, what, over 31 years? 31 years. 31 yeah. years. So we'll talk about that. I think most people uh, in the community associate you with the paper, but there's many other <clears throat> things we could talk about, we will talk about tonight. Um, you've written about uh, music. You've written about uh, other topics aside from the Herald and Review. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, growing up, you collected 45s, right? Yeah, I was, yeah. I got my first one when I was like five or six, hand me down from a babysitter, and I just kept on, um, kept on acquiring them. I was close, I was uh, lucky enough to live in a place where there was a guy who used to put records in and out of jukeboxes, uh -huh. and when they wouldn't get plays, they, he would take them, and he would just take these 45s that he already had, and he wasn't going to put them in another jukebox. He'd just toss them in a box, and the kids would come out and go through them, and he'd charge a dime apiece. Wow. I can't tell you how much time I spent out there. I can't tell you how many times, um, I, I can't tell you how many times I came home with 30 45s after spending three bucks. Wait, what, what was the first 45 that you actually went to the store and said, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna pay full price to there get this 45? There were two of them at the, at the same time. The first one was the more, the more popular one was Brandy, You're a Fine Girl by mm -hmm. Looking Glass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was um, Motorcycle Mama by Sail Cat. A lot of people don't remember that one. <laughs> it's just a nice novelty song. And why, why Brandy? Is it just something that, that stuck that, with that, you? That melodic pop, and that's something that I continue to love to this day. I mean, there's there's a, there's a nice keyboard in there. The vocals are, are, are very flush. You know, at, at that time, I was I was already a lover of the Beatles. Okay. So anytime you're going to have harmonies, you're going to get yeah. my attention. And just yeah. that, that, that very um, white pop sound. Right. So, so this is in Minnesota, mm -hmm. right? This is in a, a small town. Yep, southeast corner, Dodge southeast. Center, Minnesota. Population twenty one hundred. Closest metro area was Rochester. Uh, Minneapolis was about seventy miles away. Rochester's what? Maybe an hour away? Uh, about a half hour. Half hour away. Yeah. And population Rochester's at, probably at that time it was about fifty or sixty. Now it's over a hundred. Okay. So it was it was roughly the size of Decatur. Yeah. 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 In fact, it, it was growing bigger than Decatur when I moved on here. And then okay. Decatur got got smaller as I was I was here. Tell us, tell us a little about your 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 uh, your, your family and uh, brothers, sisters. Uh, I have one sister, Allison. Um, grandmother times two. Um, fantastic. Not not best friends, but we know that we are the two people in the world who best understand each other. Um, uh, we don't we don't have a lot in common. We we went our separate ways on any number of things, but we we do share a love of music. Um, my father worked for the Minnesota State Highway Department as an engineer. He was killed in a workplace accident mm. when he was 40, mm. and I was uh, I was 19. And it was yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the stuff that happens if you lose your father when you're just getting on getting on a level where you can communicate right. with him as an adult. I mean, it yeah. was. Um, my mom's still alive, and yeah, they're, they're just good, good uh, German people. <laughs> so, 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 you know, if, if, as you look now, now, as you look back at that, what were, you know, you probably, you know, growing up, you, it may be like the air. You don't know what your values are until mm -hmm. so you, you get a little bit older and you'll be able to look back at yourself. What, how would you describe the, the values that, that, you, uh, that you grew up with? Yeah, I, it, it just was very matter of fact. You know, you, you, you worked for a living, you did your best, you were nice to other people, and um, that, was, that was what my mom and dad were. Yeah. Um, I was not so much that way when I, when I was a kid. I was, I, was um, I was the small town kid who really needed to be in a big town. Mm. If I'd been in a bigger city, there, there, there would have been enough in the school to distract me from my, from my anger. Mm. But, you know, th there are, you know, my high school class was 60 people. We're in a very small school, mm. only so many options of mm -hmm. classes that can be taken by somebody mm. who's not really interested in math or science. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm taking all the lit classes and all the writing classes and all the English classes, but you got, you know, I'm seeing the same three teachers all the time, and they're getting as sick of me as I am of them, and, you know, Two of them were also 
uh, in the theater, and I was involved in the theater, and there was another one who was a speech coach, and I was in declamation, and you know, um, so I was a I was an irritating smart aleck a lot, of mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and I think I think that probably. Um, my parents thought that they had done horribly wrong, and, and I was, I've always, I always, I say to my mom to this day, you did exactly what you're supposed to do. Your job was to make yourself obsolete, you know, and I'm not supposed to need you now. So, you did your job. I mean, that's, I mean, and a lot of the, a lot of the, what people see as bluntness of me is straight out of my mom. You know, my, my mom on her side, very direct. Mm -hmm. and, Pretty German in a sense. Yes, yeah. yes, and I and always appreciated that. Yeah. So, so even as a kid, you were you were oriented toward what I describe as, um, you know, forms of expression or, mm -hmm. or artistic yeah. forms. And and how did that then find expression? You went to university next, or went to a community college. Community college and. Uh, Took whatever classes I, I I was I was planning originally to transfer to the University of Minnesota or University of Missouri at Columbia, okay, which That's had a journalism school. Yeah, yeah. Was regarded yeah. as the best journalism right. school in the country, and I was, and I got through um, a year of college. I became it was a community college two year school, so I was going to be the editor of the school paper mm -hmm. the next year. I had landed a job proofreading with the local daily newspaper and um, and then had ended up, up later on you know, within within a few months applying for a job in the sports department there taking phone calls at night and stuff so I was already in and it was and they knew me so it's yeah, kind of easy yeah. but I was all that stuff was building toward toward where I was going and after a year Oh, taking community college classes. I thought this is nonsense. I'm not gonna. I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm already working in newspapers, right. so I, I kept. But I kept going just because. What else am I gonna do? And I'm the editor of the paper, so yeah. I, you know. I feel yeah. like. And then th that that uh, winter, the Minnesota Community College teachers went on a strike. Oh. So so the paper was was actually a really important way of delivering information to both the students and the faculty. Right. And you know, took that obviously took that pretty seriously too. Um, so I, I just kind of lazed along in my second year. I decided I wasn't going to transfer. Took one quarter off, and then thought, okay, I need I need to finish up my degree mm -hmm. and get at least get something that shows that I've been here. So I went yeah. to finish an associate arts degree. But by that time, I was working full time at the well, not, not quite full time yet at the newspaper, but it was close. It was going to happen. So you you were right into, I mean, even. Even you know, as a kid, you were already working for the newspaper. Yeah, I was thirteen. And you, you, I mean, you must. I mean, obviously, you liked it or loved it or something, because you know, you went. You did it just feel right to you? Well, you see, I, I can't. I still can't believe that people get paid to do this. Yeah. To me, it mean, I, I put on music and start writing, and it's it, it's the most relaxing thing in the world. An hour is a minute. A minute is an hour. It's yeah. fa fantastic, and I feel so good when I'm doing it. And then sometimes I go back and read it and go, God, I wrote that. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, I started when I was 12 or 13 at my uh, the, at the weekly newspaper in my hometown, yeah. in Dodge Center. We yeah. wrote for the Star Record. Um, I think I started out at two cents a word, and then eventually got bumped up to five cents a word. And they stopped buying my stuff when I started handing in, you know, thousand word right. stories for those, right. you know, <laughs> which, which, which I, th I think every, everybody who ever is paid that way has to learn that. So yeah. it, was, it was important for me to learn that. And 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 did you go from there then to to, to the Herald Review? Or um, I was I was I worked at the Rochester Post Bulletin for. Oh, I, I started there full time, nineteen eighty one, and um, if I'm trying to remember exactly, how, well, it, yeah, I was I I'd been an intern, I'd been a summer intern for two years there. I mean, it was I was just I was just around so much yeah. that, that really putting me on the payroll permanently was it was just okay. Well, when when is the slot going to open that we can drop him into? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, but yeah, before long, and then I was there for uh, five, six years before I got, before I thought I, I need to do something else. I needed to, get, I need to get out of the winter. I really dislike Minnesota weather. So that. And, and, and how did the Herald Review come about? Then I wrote, 
I, I had one. I was I was writing um, just blind letters to every newspaper I could find, and I only had two rules. They had to be south of the Iowa Iowa southern border. Okay. And they had to be west of the Mississippi. Well, that makes me think. I got it half right. <laughs> yeah. We must be barely south of the yeah, barely south of the Iowa yeah. southern border. Well, and, and I just I I actually I didn't even I did not reach out to the Herald Review at all. The okay. Herald Review reached out oh, to me, which okay. was um, uh, the I'd written to the Kansas City Star. I see. And the uh, editor, the edit, the sports editor in Decatur at the time had worked at the Kansas City Star and knew this guy uh, really okay. well. Okay. And. Um, the guy indicator called the guy in Kansas City and said, "Do you have any good copy desk candidates?" And the guy in Kansas City said, "Well, I just, I just got this one that might be interesting." Uh, wow. When, and when I'm talking to the, when I'm talking to the sports editor with Steve Cameron, um, I, I said, he said, "Do you know where Decatur is?" And I said, "Is it one of the Quad Cities?" <laughs> and then he, and he, he said, "No." I said, well, "Okay, well, but there's one that starts with a D, Davenport." Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> but uh, and I came down, uh, came down for an interview in the middle of December, and uh, um, didn't get the didn't get the job. Somebody else uh, was was taken ahead of me. When they called to tell me that, they said, we think we're going to have another opening in about three months. If you can hang in there, we'll see. And, I mean, I, st I still kept looking other places, but I also kept calling back to Cater. You know? Right. I mean, that was... And you said you wanted your th to Those were the times when Mark Tupper and I were, were, were first becoming acquainted with each other, where he'd talk to me for five or ten minutes, or if, if he found out that, if he found out from somebody else in the office that they were on the phone with me, he would grab the phone from him, he was trying to trying to charm me down here. Like well, there must have been good chemistry, right, on both sides, because obviously they gave you that clue yeah. that, hey, you know, hang in there. And you were calling back, so you must have had a pretty good feeling about the place. I, I, I wanted to get out. Yeah. But when I came down and did my interview, it was it was, pro it was one of the most fun evenings I've ever had for as long as I've been in Decatur. Really? I mean, it, it, it was a, it was astonishing. I mean, everybody was kind of um, trying to show off all of their best behavior and, and um, show off their extremes, too. And it, it was really entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was that? What was well, um, rest his soul, Rex Spires was was showing how he how he could drink more than any human being you, you could imagine. And where were you? Uh, the Lincoln Lounge. Oh, okay. Yeah, we they had, <clears throat> we had been at the office for about an hour and a half, and it was a hectic. Uh, high school sports night. Yeah, and so they just wanted to get me. They wanted to kind of scoop me out and get my attention someplace else. So um, the sports editor and the assistant, which was Steve Cameron and Mark Tupper, took me to the link and basically issued everybody orders. Come on over when you're done. I'm from Minnesota and the bars close at one. In Illinois, the bars close at two, and. Um, the Lincoln Lounge would sometimes make uh, make allowances for policemen and for newspaper people, mm. as we would all be hanging out in there well after hours. Right. So I don't know what time I don't know what time I got got to the hotel that night. Uh, I was staying at the what, what's the one that was just down the down the street with the concert? Yeah, the Ambassador. Yeah, I had a room at the Ambassador, and I was walking from the Lincoln over there, and I was. I was distracted hmm. by something, and then somebody said something, and I turned around and I walked right into a parking meter. <laughs> and I hadn't been drinking, but I, and I thought, well, these guys are going to going to think that I am drinking, so I need to do something. So I took two steps back and slapped them. So I just sla I slapped the parking <laughs> meter, and then they were they were thoroughly amused by that. And like I say, they were, everybody else had had either one joke or one. Um, one thing that they kind of had to show just to show this is a, this would be a good place to work and and, it, and you know I mean I, I did get into a family with I mean I still I remember all the guys I worked with in, in the department throughout the year and throughout the years and remember all of them fondly. So so what was your what was your first assignment then? In uh, when you started Harold? I, 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 I'm not sure. 
What was your role? I, I was a copy editor, and okay. that was one of the things okay. I, I wanted to get away from the, the the mundane high school writing stuff. I didn't really feel like I wanted to be a news reporter, and entertainment reporting jobs were really prime. Um, so the best way for me to get out of Minnesota would be to work on the desk, write headlines, flow copy, and stuff like that. And that seemed to be more palatable, regular schedule and stuff. And I did that for, um, did that for about three years and got sick of it and started building a website. But I had my first assignment was probably um, Springfield Cardinals, um, the baseball, the, the single A baseball team. Okay. Their okay. one of their press conferences or one of their preseason things. And the reason I remember is because uh, I'm a Minnesota Twins fan, and a Minnesota Twins pitcher was a coach on that team. Ah. And I went up and shook his hand, and he had muscles upon muscles. I thought, pitchers aren't supposed to be this cut. I, I mean, of course, that, that might have been the, my first evidence of uh, steroids among people mm, in yeah. sports, too. <laughs> so you've obviously you've done a lot of things over the years, lots of stories. What, you know, is there any one story that, that you know, stands out in your imagination as one of the most interesting or... The, the Mark Whitaker thing. Yeah. Continue, you know, fascinates me to this day. I, I don't know... I... I I guess the best way to tell that story is that the way I ended up getting it was because I was being me. I, I had written something about um, something about the informant as, as the, you know we were starting to get to the buildup of the thing actually finally happened. Yeah, let's back up. So let's just frame this. Sure. Not, maybe everybody it's hard, hard hard to believe that sure, everybody sorry. might not know who Mark Whitaker is. But you're talking about the the ADM scandal right. and the price fixing uh, scandal that transpired. Yeah, Mark, and Mark Whitaker Mark. was an executive. Was really at the center of that? Yeah, as a whistleblower. And the informant is a movie about that mm -hmm. that whole experience that is set here in Decatur. Yeah, and it's I mean, and, and his story is really strange. There's, um, I mean, no, nobody's really really sure about what his background <laughs> it really is. Right. Uh, because he is he's a nor notorious liar. Yeah. And um, he was a whistleblower in a price-fixing case on Lysine. And at the same time, he was basically stealing money from ADM and shipping it to uh, offshore accounts. Hmm. He, 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 the explanation he gave for what he was doing was he wasn't sure that the FBI was going to take care of him hmm. because he knew that he was going to be out of luck once he got done with the whistleblowing. So... He was making sure that he had something to had, had something for himself, and the FBI had asked him continually, "Is, is there anything we need to know? Is there anything mm -hmm. that you're doing?" What are you? And he kept on saying, "No, no, no." And he got caught with this, and that that ends up blowing up. You know, sure. obviously the FBI's case, you know, it's it's still solid enough because all the things happened, but they were working with a crook. Right. You know, so and Mark had um, he, he had gotten out of jail. He did, I think, seven years, and he'd gotten out of jail, but he hadn't talked to anybody, and we weren't even sure exactly where he was. Mm. And I just, I just wrote, I wrote a column. Um, that I, I want to say I was answering questions about the informant, mm. or and like posing the questions that somebody would ask me, and then giving the answers. And one of them, one of one of my questions was. Why don't we have Why don't we have Mark Whitaker's version of the story? Mm -hmm. And I wrote, as far as I know, he's not talking to anybody. Mm -hmm. If he wants to talk to us, I I hope that I'm on his list. Mm -hmm. You know, but right now nobody is. And then, with, within a week of that, his wife had emailed me. Okay. And um, she basically thanked me for you know. So we appreciate there's there's you know you, you kind of cut down on some of the frenzy <laughs> because you've actually reported some truthful things. Yeah. Um, and then I, I wrote her back and thanked her and said, if Mark ever decides he wants to talk, please let him know that I'd be, I'd love to listen to his story. And she wrote back, well, I'll, I'll mention it to him. And then within a week, I was interviewing Mark for the first of like seven times to put together what ended up being um, about 300 inches of story. And to put that in perspective, 300 inches would fill up three... Full newspaper pages without any pictures. Yeah, you yeah. know, so 
I had written, there, and, and it wasn't all one big story. There were there were different pieces of it, and um, so he was, was still local. He was still uh, he was in Florida or? at the time. Oh, he was in Florida. He was okay. in Florida, and that's where that's where he had served. That's where he had served his time. Okay. And then um, so he, he was down there, and basically he had just started working for this company, and mm-hmm. they basically encouraged him to. Um, to, to, to talk to get their name in the in the spotlight. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm far and away. That's that's the one because it it impacted my life for so long mm-hmm. because there were it, it was it was talked about for years before it was actually happening, and you know you could never nail down exactly what was going on and you know the. the the rumors about it continued right up to the release date because the release date on it changed at least seven times. Um, and then the way they were going to market it and the way they were going to put it around the country, they, they were changing it on a regular basis. <clears throat> um, but So I had all that beforehand and then the lead up to them coming here and then when they were actually here, we, we did extensive stuff with that. And then we're waiting for the movie to come out, and then the movie comes out. And we have another flood of stories about that, and you know, so this thing represents you know several five years of my life. Yeah, 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 several phases. And you were in, you were actually in the in the movie. Yeah, they, when I I was I just got a call at home one night. It was when the when the people were in town, and I I had written some things that basically said that these people are here doing a job, you know. So don't expect them to be big partiers. This is this is their work. This is how they're earning their cash. And um, just, and I did some video stuff too that was that was basically saying the same thing. So here's what's going on. You know, if you see them, be nice to them. But if they don't seem to be very receptive, well, you know, they're they're tourists who want to be left alone, or they're working tourists who want to be left alone. And apparently, some of that uh, received uh, was received in a positive way by people connected with the production. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After. After they were here for like a week and a half, they said, "I got a call at home, like you say, from from one of the guys." Who said, "Do you want a part in this?" Mm-hmm. I said, "Of course I do." Mm-hmm. And and I, I thought, "Well, they're just joking." But yeah. and he said, "No, I'll, he said, I'll send you some stuff." And I waited and waited, and so a week didn't see anything. Oh, okay, and then um, and then after a week, then there was all this stuff in my in my mail, my postal mail. It was you know my lines and what they were wanting me to do. What they were wanting me to bring to the set and stuff. So, what was that like being actually, in, you know, yeah, it was, in, 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 uh, filmed? Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I always said it was. It was b- better than film class. It was better than any kind of film class I could imagine taking, mm-hmm. just because I learned so much. Mm-hmm. Um, the entire first day it was raining, and for the most part, I just sat in my trailer and tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I mean, I I, first, I had a trailer, which was pretty cool. And uh, but there was there was one TV between there were like three of us there were three media people mm-hmm. and uh, so the, it, and kind of as a rule they, yeah, like after well they, 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 um, people from the production team had come in at some point and said are you available tomorrow if we need to back this up oh, sure um, and at the end of the day when they said well we're we're going to stop now and we'd been there probably six hours. Mm. Um, we got put into. It was, it said, they said we've got somebody we want you to meet, and so um, they piled us in a van and got into the um, into the Whitaker house, that the house that he actually lived in, where they were actually filming, and that was where hmm. my stuff got filmed. Hmm. And um, walked into the living room, and there was Steven Soderbergh, the hmm. director. Hmm. Now, I am a huge Steven Soderbergh fan. Um, so, but I didn't dare say anything. I mean, I but I was just I was completely geeking out, and he he was I mean he basically treated us as his guests. You know, I mean we, he was just spectacular. And when people asked me about it afterwards, they said I didn't wet my pants. I, I you know I'm really proud of that because Steven Soderbergh was was not only a really talented artist, he's a really cool guy. And then the next day was when we did our filming and. Um, probably sat around for two or three hours. In we were in the house because we were going to be work, doing our work outside the house. Yeah, that was where we were going to film our scenes. Yeah. And so we're sitting in the basement, which had a hot tub. 
that was covered up. I mean, it's, it was it was it was it was, it was like a, a really big living room that all of us were sitting in. And then over in the corner was this hot tub. There was a huge TV in the middle of the room. <laughs> Jeez, who lives like this? Um, and then I, I, it was there that I made the biggest mistake that I made on the set. Mm. Um, we were. Um, we were just. We were, I was asking questions. One of the guys who was there was the guy who films the behind-the-scenes stuff for DVDs. Oh. He does a lot of those. And he, was, he, he said, "I do this stuff, and nobody watches it." And I said, well, "I watch those." And then I, I, I said, "He said, well, what, what ones do you like?" And I listed three or four of them. Yeah. One of them he happened to do. Yeah. He said, "So you actually watched that?" I said, "I watched it a couple times." Yeah. Yeah. So, so he kind of became my conduit to all this, to all the actual film speak stuff. Okay. And. Um, we, we were just chatting. I was asking general questions, and then at one point, he said, "What's the what's the budget on this?" And they all looked at me like I had like like I had stabbed their children in front of them. They were horrified. When we were on the set of a movie, Tim, we don't talk about the budget. So, oh, okay, okay. I didn't know that, but okay, thanks. <laughs> and then filmed our scene six or eight times. Mm. I thought I spoiled one of them. Just by stumbling on my on my line, mm. um, I got yelled at once because my head was in the way of somebody who was shooting from behind me. But I didn't know, mm. and nobody had said anything to me. And, right. And we finished the scene, and Soderbergh said, "Oh, how, how, how did everybody look?" And I hear this voice behind me I said, "Well, I didn't get anything because this gentleman's head is in the way." Well, whose head is in the way? And, he, and I turn around. And he says, "Yeah, you." <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and that, uh, I had one other really fun moment on, on that. Um, the guy who played uh, um, Mick, um, Rick Overton, mm -hmm. is is a stand-up comedian, and I've been a fan of his for, well, at that time it would have been 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I saw him the first day we were in the set. He, he came walking up to a group, and I said, well, I'm, I'm at least going to say hi, Rick, I really um, and I shook his hand. I said, "Hi, Rick. I'm Tim, a longtime fan." He said, "You're that guy, aren't you?" And I kind of. He said, "Have you done like video things talking about this?" And I said, "Yeah," because I had had a segment that we filmed at the office called oh, "At My Desk." Okay. And I would I was would talk about this. I mean, and it was not something we did just for the movie. It was something we've been doing for a long time, yeah. just to get something fun and dopey out on the internet. Mm -hmm. But he recognized me from that. Wow. And a lot of them did. I mean, there was, there uh, like, the, um, one of the assistant directors came up and said, you know, we were really enjoying the videos. And the person who did my makeup the second day said, uh, we really appreciate when you wrote that column that we were talking about how we were here to work. People don't understand yeah. that sometimes. Well, that's kind of cool because they were probably trying to scope out yeah, the local scene, and you obviously came up with that. that, that I program. went into the. They had a production office in the Millican Building, which I only knew because somebody else said, "I think they're in there." Yeah. Um, and I wasn't supposed to know. Yeah. And I went in there because there was a specific question I had to ask them, and they were surprised that I had that I had found out where they were, and I <laughs> I had all these questions that they didn't think that anybody else knew that knew that these questions had to be asked. Yeah. But when I got into the office, um, there was only one thing hanging on the wall, and that was the uh, Herald Review with my interview with uh, with Mark okay. Whitaker in there. Okay. And uh, and then well, then there was, there was that, and then there was a well, like a cartoon drawing of a piece of corn, mm -hmm. and then there was a note tacked up that said, "This is why we're here." Okay. And I thought oh, okay, that's interesting. That's fun. And then I got yelled at for that. <laughs> You actually talked to the FBI as well. Yeah, talked uh, to talk to the, the two agents that were that are that are portrayed in the film, and um, one of them is really suspicious of the media, you know, because of the way so much of Mark's story played out. You know, they came off looking kind of foolish. They looked yeah. like they had bungled things, and they had. They'd just been taken by a guy that they. They shouldn't have been taken by, but they were. Everybody was yeah. exactly, and I mean, I'll, I've I've said to this day that having talked to him and just kind of um, you know, ha having the community, just the phone communication that he and I had, I could easily understand how anybody could fall for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, at one point I went into my editor's office, and it was when I was continuing to write stories about 
about Mark and about, you know because he was talking to me about additional things and there were pieces I was able to use in columns about the movie and stuff. And I went into my editor and I said, I'm really worried because I believe him. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, what are you worried about? And I said, what if he's a liar? I mean, I, I think we've kind of... I, th- I think we've kind of established that this guy does have a routine. Um, and my boss reassured me and basically said, well, we're, not, we're not endorsing anything he's saying. We're just reporting what he is saying. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I guess I can live with that, but I really am uncomfortable yeah. with, with some of these things. And the, the line in the movie that rang true the most to me was uh, when, when the agent was talking to his wife, Mark, why do you have to lie all the time? I mean, and I thought, that's the story of that guy's life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, why do you got to do this? Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's like, it's, it's like you're uh, Ringo Starr and you're going to try and lie and convince people you're Paul McCartney. Like, you know, what you were was good enough. Who are you trying to impress? Yeah, so, yeah, fascinating character. Let's, let's, let's back up a little bit and, and now take a kind of a big picture look. Because you've lived this now in the newspaper business. You've seen, you've lived it. It's very... Uh, tumultuous period in the history of, of the newspaper business—a hard period mm-hmm. uh, for the for the forty years that you've been involved. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how the business has changed and 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 and, and where it's going? The biggest change is the you know, obviously the timing, you know, and, and we've gone through that with our media consumption during my lifetime, you know, going from three channels and the news was on at six and ten yeah and now the news is on whenever you want it and we've even got news that will tell you exactly what you want to hear that's how that's how advanced we are you know so um, I, I there, there, there are there are some things that that we miss that obviously we can't get back but it's unfortunate that they're gone and the big thing for me is just that little bit of time to reflect and analyze and, and think about the things that you've heard, the things that were said, and try to fit them into the matrix of the life that's around you to figure out, you know, okay, to whom is this important and why? But instead, now it's just more important to get out there that it is. Okay, and... Okay? Just because a newspaper, a newspaper person interprets something for you, it doesn't mean that they're skewing it. It means that they are giving you a depth of understanding that you might not otherwise have. Is it, is it always perfect? No, it's not. No, it's not. Is it preferable to what I see now, where immediately the spin comes out and we're going to spin it exactly the way that we want it spun? I mean, most newspaper people that I've known in my life take the time to listen to as much information as possible before they puke something back out at you. And it's it's not that way so much anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and you see that with everyone in social media. I mean, it's not just... It's not just newspaper people and radio people and TV people. It's every single person who has a Facebook or a Twitter account. They're all part of the media. Right. That's social media. Right. You know, so they're adding. If you're, if you're not adding to the content, you're adding to the noise. And there's just a lot of noise. Mm-hmm. And there always has been a lot of noise. It just is more. It's more now because more people have megaphones. Yeah. 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 So there's, uh, you know, 24/7, constant. Yep. And the other thing you mentioned, kind of in passing, was that um, you, you, you can get whatever flavor it is you want. And what's what's the what's the famous uh, musical line? Um, Man hears what he wants to hear. Yeah, disregards the rest. Disregards the rest. Right. So that was maybe ahead of the ahead of, ahead yeah. of what happened in in uh, current media. But either that or it shows that we've been that way all along. It's yeah. just it's more obvious it's just, it's that we more, can, yeah, yeah, the way we're able to do it yeah. now. Yeah. Um, yeah, but at, at the at the same time, um, I I hated waiting twenty four minutes to get a color photo mm-hmm. because that's how long it would take. It would uh, the machine that we had would spit out a piece of a, a plate or a photo that would be used as the yeah. as the red, yellow, and uh, magenta, yeah. and then the black 
but it would take six minutes for each one of those to come. And once in a while, if you get the transit, you're trying to pull it in via satellite, transmission messes up. It's just like getting a blank space on your website now. But we weren't hitting reload. We had to wait another 24 minutes for the picture to come through again. <laughs> it, it means, so I, I, I don't miss that at all. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the other things you've, you've done for a, for a long time is uh, sports talk. Um, you, you've hosted sports talk with, with Mark Tupper. Mm-hmm. Would you, could you talk a little yeah, bit we're, about that, we're in our, how that's evolved? We're in our second century. Yeah, of, of the second the century. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> just, um, <laughs> the 30 years, the first thing I did when I came to the Decatur was I was on the radio. I was on WDZ, drove into town on a Saturday night, and Mark and Steve Cameron were doing really? sport talk okay. at that time. And I, I, th- I thought I remembered from when I came before where the place was. I, I don't know how I did it or, or why. I mean, it, it had to be insane for me to drive from Rochester, Minnesota, in a <laughs> in a um, in a '75 Nova, and the hatch didn't even the hatch didn't even work properly. I had the hatch like belted down, so <laughs> I go over a bump in the back end. Would, you know, and and somehow I thought, well, driving down here, I'll manage to find my way. To WDZ, I drove right to it. I, I, I can't explain that to this day. And I walked in, and it was, it was just an empty space. I mean, I, and I, I couldn't. I, I had seen other cars out there, and I thought, well, somebody's got to be here. And then it, the studio was way in the back of the building. And I poked my head in during a commercial, and they put me on here in the next segment. Wow. Was talking about what it was, and, and the, the, I had I had done a fair amount of radio when I was oh, in college. Okay, so I I didn't have any fear of a microphone right. or anything like that, and um, they started viewing me as a potential substitute host for when one of the two of them was going to be gone. Okay, and so I filled in that role for a little while, and then when Steve left, Mark asked me if I would do it with him permanently. And, okay, I mean I've I've always said to Mark, if you don't want to do it with me, you can tell me to leave. I'm, I'm good with it. I don't want to be an anchor for you or anything. We we continue to work together. I would guess that Mark would continue to do it if I stopped. I would not if Mark stopped. Mm-hmm. You know? because, because it, I mean, his his name is first for a good reason. You know, um, I am. I call myself a caddy for him. You know, and. and it might sound like that's a negative. It's not a negative. Being a caddy for Mark Tupper on the radio can be difficult. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's something I do well. Um, I think it's it's the one way that he and I really mesh together. Um, and I, I think the moment that we started to mesh was in the midst of the whole Tanya Harding thing. Oh, okay. Um, and we were talking about it, and we. Got into a really intense argument about it. Mm. Um, I was saying that people were convicting Tanya Harding because of her background, and that they were rooting for Nancy uh, for Nancy Kerrigan because she was the proper, she was the proper kind of uh, ice skating queen that we wanted. Um, I, I still stand by much of that position. I mean, I, I've said to this day, if, if Nancy Kerrigan actually had something to do with this, why would she not cash in on it? Why why would she continue to suffer? The slings and arrows that come all the time from this. Why would she not at least take the hundred thousand dollars and live decently for a couple of years? And that was basically the. I mean, that, that that was the. That's the end of the argument that Mark and I were having mm-hmm. at, at the beginning mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And there weren't any phone calls, which was strange at that time because I mean it, it is a talk show. It was driven by calls. It's less so now because. We've adapted it to the point where we have an idea what our audience wants to hear, so we mm-hmm. talk about it before they call about right, it. Right, right. Um, but we went back and forth on this for almost an hour on the air without without an interruption, and then we finally okay, we got to take a break, and somebody somebody in the room said, well, there weren't there weren't any calls during that segment, and I said, yeah, maybe I should have kept my mouth shut, and the guy that said, well, no, you know what's happening there, don't you? I said no. I said everybody's listening. Mm. They don't. They don't want to interrupt this conversation because right. it's fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, we had our, we've had our share of those. But that, that was that was the big one. And I, and, you know, in retrospect, I realized that's 
that's the good role that we that we play for one another is that we can see some of those things. Yeah, you can, you can have that dialogue on the air, right? And 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 really uh, engage the audience. Yeah, and and you can do it without without what you'd expect a lot of times when you hear those conversations someplace else. You know, neither one of us is going to swear at the other. Nobody's going to take a swing at anybody. Yeah. No beer is going to get poured over anybody's head. Yeah. So, like I said, we continue to do that to this day, and I, I enjoy that a lot with him. Okay. So you, you kind of learned uh, how to do that. Yeah, you, you matched, and then, and then, yeah. I think we both had that kind of personality yeah. where I'm not necessarily a person who can carry something, but I can help you carry it. Yeah. And I can do whatever you want me to do when I'm helping you carry it. I do things with Eric Lee's show now, where it's just a matter of keep continuing to drive the drive the show off the rails. Uh-huh. You know, they love taking it off the rails. I think it's funnier than hell when they do it, and I encourage them. Mm-hmm. You know, if I can go in there and be a source of anarchy, I want to be that. <laughs> well, very good. So, now you've got a whole variety of interests. Um, and, and, you know, you talked about your involvement in the movie, but you already had some theatrical experience, didn't you? I had the, the, the theater that I did here came after the movie. Oh, it did? When I had done uh, theater in high school. Yeah. And then some uh, some church-based drama when I was a young okay. adult in, in Minnesota. And then just kind of set it aside when I came down here. It was never anything that I um, wanted to pursue with any great desire. But Did the, did the movie then make no. you think, oh, I can No, no not at all. Oh, it, was, okay. it was my friendship with the, with the director of the okay. play that I was in. Okay. Um, and we, we kind of talked about it one day, and I said, okay, I'll come in and do a reading. And I went in and did a reading, and she said, yeah, I think you'll be okay. So I did, uh, I, I played Dodge in Sam Shepard's Buried Child. Okay. And the uh, Buried Child of the title is a literal. There literally is a buried child in this play. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kind of play the comic relief. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an old, bitter man, speaking of typecasting. <laughs> So were you driving it off the rails in that too? Or um, not really? Well, it was it was a group of there was there was one person who had more than two plays in two Decatur Public plays under the belt. Okay. Um, and the rest of us were all newcomers. You know, they they they'd done high school things and stuff like that, but nothing at this okay. nothing at the community level. Yeah, yeah. And not to say that the community level is better. You know, I mean, I've seen high school productions around here that are just so fantastic that I would just, yeah, I, I would have I would have been proud to be involved in some small way in any one of them. Um, but th- this was a lot of a lot of young people and me and one other guy. And uh, um, yes, I kind of had to be the adult. And I was scared to death. Um, the Wednesday before the Friday in which we opened, um, my wife woke up to me standing at my dresser crying mm-hmm. and she said what's wrong I said I don't think I can do this mm-hmm. you know, I, I think I may I think this may be the first time I've taken more than I can do mm-hmm. and got through it yeah I mean I was it was it great it was okay it'd be better now I'd have more discipline but the director would know how to better handle me so are you gonna do more? Or? Uh, if the opportunity comes up, okay. if, if the right thing comes along, okay. yeah, I, I haven't shut it out by any stretch okay. of the imagination. Right. Very good. Now, a lot of people don't know that you've published uh, one book mm-hmm. on on the Decatur celebration. Yeah, the first twenty five years. First twenty five years. The Fred Pooley years. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I got to the point. I got really ambitious around the twentieth year of it, and thought there really isn't anything that gathers up. All of the information about this, you know, so 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 much, so many of the things that um, that are being told about it are piecemeal. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, I know a little bit of this, I know a little bit of that. So I tried, I, I talked extensively to uh, probably a half dozen people who who've been involved in varying degrees for varying years, and pulled their story together. And, um, used the Herald and View archives as a supplement, mm-hmm. and you know, obviously I I've been covering it since since 2000 because that was when I, when I became entertainment editor, and um, I had thought early on when I started when I became entertainment editor that we had not done the event 
the historical justice that it deserves. So I tried to tried to start building some of those things. You know, here here's the, here's the best. Here's the the best food. Here's the best performers. Mm -hmm. and just to try and give us some kind of baseline, so we would build to build from there. If somebody wanted to. To, to buy it, will you find it on Amazon? Yeah, or Amazon. It's, it's okay. only an ebook at this point. Okay. I, haven't, I haven't set it up for a right. Plan, so, but, right. But, but I will find it as an ebook on Amazon. Yep, and uh, three dollars. What, what, what Decatur Celebration? Um, it's a Decatur Celebration: The History of the World's Fair of the Prairie. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Under my name, Tim Kane. See, so if you go, if you put in Decatur Celebration and a cane, you'll find it. Okay. And and you've got another book. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it'll be called. It, yeah, who, who knows when it's going to come out? I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping um, by fall, fall uh, Thanksgiving time maybe. Um, it's called How Can You Not Hear That, and it's so titled because I end up saying that to people a lot when I'm playing them music and they don't understand what I'm <laughs> why I'm playing it for them. How can you not hear that? <laughs> and it'll be it's a collection of essays about music, uh, different columns I've written, some interviews I've done, some thoughts I've had. Very good. Well, you know, you've been here for uh, in Decatur for uh, what thirty one years? years. That we figure out. Yep. So you kind of um, you're kind of a local now, I would say. <laughs> Am I? Because I I, I I thought it was probably like forty years before they actually call you one. But. Uh, it's probably something <laughs> like that. But uh, you know, so so on the one hand, you're not from Decatur, so you have another perspective. Mm -hmm. But you've been here long enough to be a, to really be a local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I and you know, I, I hate to say I hate to throw out the cliche, but I do like it here. Yeah, and and, and why? What what is it about Decatur that's that's unique or, or likable or what well, for you? The 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 people are amazing. I, you know, and I and I know that people say that in a lot of different places, and I'm sure it's true in a lot of different places. But I have been working at the Herald View for 31 years and have regularly told people when they leave, you might get a better job, but you're never going to like one, like it as much as you like this one. Mm -hmm. And I have had at least a dozen people say, you're exactly right. You know, I'm, but my, my job is better now, but God, if I could have that attitude and the pay I've got, I'd come back to the gator in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that the people who were hiring people at the paper knew how to bring in compatible personalities for the most part. They think that Decatur is a pretty mellow place. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, as I've become friendly with some of its, uh, some of its natives, I've grown more and more fond of the place. We, I, I, I didn't, well, we didn't buy a house until 1999. You know, so that time, by that time, I've been here for 10 years. And I kept on thinking, well, we're gonna, I would, my original plan was only to be here for three years. I was going to be here for three years and either go to Cincinnati, Fresno, California, or Kansas City. That was that was definitely the plan. And I did not try, but I also don't feel real bad that I didn't get any of them. Yeah. Because I'm still working here. I mean, with the way jobs have been cut in newspapers, had I gone someplace bigger, my job might not exist. True, true. Well, Tim, thank you so much for everything that you've done, you've contributed, and it's been great uh, talking with you this evening. So, my honor, my honor, thank you. For History of the Heartland, thank you so much.